All right, it's ASP.NET Core time. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, so uh, this is Syed Ibrahim Hashimi, yeah. and yeah. he's a PM on the Visual Studio for Mac team that focuses on web tools and ASP.NET Core. Yeah, that's exactly right. So yeah. great, let's dig in. All right, cool. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, the first thing we're going to take a look at is uh, what, what, what are the different types of projects uh, you can create for uh, ASP.NET Core and .NET Core with inside Visual Studio for Mac. And then uh, we'll kind of start moving on from there. All right, let me open up uh, my Visual Studio for Mac here. I'll go into a new solution. We'll kind of take a quick tour here. Uh, most, of the, most of the templates that you're going to be looking for are under the .NET Core node here. So these are the same exact templates that are available in uh, Visual Studio when running on Windows and also from .NET New out of the uh, .NET CLI. That's a that's a really cool thing that it's built on top of that same scaffolding system, right? Yeah, yeah, that's so right. So so when we when we first kind of created .NET new, you know, we did create it with the mind that you know there's going to be multiple different kind of hosts. Yeah. Right. And um, I, I like that about this too that you worked on that oh, .NET yeah, right. new experience early right. on. Yeah, so it's cool right. to see that. That's right. Yeah. You know, that's honestly one of the one of the things I'm really proud of is the .NET new and the template engine and. I think it's really great experience for for template authors. You know, creating and maintaining templates in the past was, wow, really, really hard. Really so hard it's cool that that those same templates work across yep. the different experiences, including Visual Studio. So yeah, I. exactly. And then you know, you can imagine in the future, maybe maybe we have some additional hosts as well. You know, like there's nothing to say that can't be a web host. So uh, yeah, right. you never know. You never know what what we can do with that. Yep. Uh, so yeah, definitely. And you know, it's very cool that they're the same exact templates yeah. across everywhere that we are. You know, so especially so really if you're valuable. working on a team and you've got some people using Visual Studio for mm -hmm. Windows and some on Visual Studio Code, some on Visual Studio for Mac or whatever editor, to know that they're all going to have that same experience with that. So yeah, exactly. You know, when when we're kind of creating the tooling features for ASP.NET Core, that's one of our main kind of focus points. Is you know, you should be able to have a mixed uh, team. You know, let's say, for example, if I'm using Visual Studio for Mac and, and John is using Windows with Visual Studio, and then we got some colleagues that might be using, let's say, Visual Studio Code on Linux. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they should all be able to kind of party together and create the same sort of applications and have the same sort of features. Yep. Um, so the, the synergy between Visual Studio for Mac and Visual Studio is a little bit higher than let's say Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, because right. you know, on the Visual Studio for Mac side, we've got an understanding of the solution file and, and, uh, and the, the assets in the, in the same exact way that you know, Visual Studio itself has. And, and the IDE kind of feel to it too, right? Yeah, so yeah, of course, works. right. So that, that's the other kind of big difference. You know, people ask me, what's the difference between Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio for Mac? And, and uh, the answer is, you know, uh, Visual Studio for Mac is an IDE that has you know, all the integrated features uh, you know, it's it's kind of like a one-stop shop, or that, that's kind of our mm -hmm. goal to make it into a one-stop shop. Uh, versus, let's say, Visual Studio Code. If you're more oriented around, you know, editing your code and running command line utilities, and and that's how you feel productive, and you know, you don't need wizards like New Project or publishing wizards. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where the Visual Studio Code comes in. Which kind of brings us back to to this point here we we're looking at, which is creating a new project. When I create a new project. You know, sometimes if I'm up and running editing a project with Visual Studio Code, that can work okay for me. But creating a new project, I'm going over to the docs because I need all the command right. line right. things. So, so what do you got That's for right. us here as far as the templates? Yeah, so here we have uh, inside the .NET Core node, we have uh, kind of three subnodes here: app, library, and tests. And we'll we'll take a look at each one of these uh, very quickly as well. So here we can see we've got uh, console and worker service, but we're going to be focusing more on the ASP.NET Core section here. Uh, let me go into a Blazor server application, and and uh, let me also say some of the things that I'm going to be showing in this talk will be in our 8.5 release that that theoretically should go out tomorrow. Um, so so if you try something with 8.4 today that uh, that you don't see available in your build, uh, hold on until tomorrow, install the update, and then and then those features should light up as well. So yeah, some some of the stuff I will show uh, is in that 8.5 release. All right, so let me create a uh, Blazor server application here. So after I after I go into it, we can see we've got a choice for authentication here. Um, so on Windows, they have they have a few additional choices to authentication. You know, you can also create applications that uh, use Azure for authentication. Mm -hmm. uh, but the vast majority of projects created with auth are created with individual in-app authentication. Right, right. And that's, that's the support that we've brought over for this release. And you know, obviously, we're going to augment this and, and kind of expand the capabilities 
Uh, but we feel like but this like is you the said, most this important. is the one I almost always use this. Then. Yeah, you know the, the the data shows I think it's supportive of like you know close to ninety percent of projects with all to use individual in app authentication. Great, great. Okay, that's right. Yep. So let me go ahead and create this uh, this Blazor server application here. Just give it a name. Then click create there. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, like what you said. It's going to call .NET new, or it's going to call so .NET new and Visual Studio. They sit on top of the template engine. So this will call into the template engine to create the project uh, with auth uh, enabled. And here we can see when when you create a project on Mac, instead of using uh, SQL Server Local DB, we use mm -hmm. SQL Lite, and that that's also true for .NET new as well. Let me go ahead and build and run this. Uh, what I'll do is I'll use the uh, the play button here. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, I have to restore my NuGet packages. Uh, that's a that's an option that I've that I've went out of my way to enable. Is you know I want to manually restore my NuGet packages. Uh, that's just, that's just kind of my workflow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but by default it will automatically restore your, your NuGet packages. Uh, so most people wouldn't see that dialog. So let me go ahead and uh, I click the play button here. That's going to start debugging and very kind of similar experience to what you have in Visual Studio. So this is creating a Blazor server application, which uh, is like single page application style, but you're, you've got authentication set up for that. Yeah, so that's, that's correct. OK. Yep, yep. All right, let me go ahead and uh, register an account here. All right. <clears throat> oh, yeah, and then uh, for the password, there's some Oh, wait, some, you're no, I know, uh, I know. Oh, uh, uh, okay. There's Smart. some there's some very particular password requirements here. Nice. So you always want to have a nice strong password. Uh, I just learned a one, hack one uppercase, one lowercase, yep. one special character, one digit, I believe I it is. I know, yeah. Uh, so one always unit like that. Co code character. Mm -hmm. one yeah, Sanskrit. your firstborn child, yeah. stuff like that. So I just so basically what happened was you know I registered an account. And then there's a confirmation step, so I just click to, to confirm that account. But you know, in a real app, you might send an email, and the user yeah. would click that link inside of an email there. Great. Let me go ahead and log in here. All right. So let's go ahead and log in. So now, basically, what happened was when we created the project, it was created with the individual and app authentication enabled. Right. And then that also came with a SQLite database that was pre-warmed up for the migrations and, and schema. And then we registered a new user, and then we logged in with basically almost kind of zero effort here. Right. Basically, yeah. So that's that's the idea there. Let me let me just go ahead and close out of this. Let's uh let's continue our kind of exploration of the uh, of the new project. There were some things that I that I forgot to talk about there. Uh, so we already talked about the ASP.NET Core node here. Mm -hmm. We've got the same templates that you'll find in Visual Studio. Uh, under Library Project, that's where you'll create your .NET standard uh, class library. Yep. For unit tests, and, and we'll take a look at unit tests, hopefully, if we have time in a little bit uh, towards the end. Uh, but we support you know, these three different uh, flavors of unit tests. Uh, yep, and then uh, the, the, last, the, the only kind of node outside of .NET Core that, uh, that most of our uh, viewers are going to be interested in for, for .NET Core is uh, under the Cloud Node for Azure Functions. Uh, yeah. So if you're developing Azure Functions, you'll go into the Cloud Node there. And we've got a session coming up just just for that. Yep. Jeff Holland's going to be showing. That's that. right. That's right. So that's that's what we got going on there. Uh, we already talked about those things. Why don't we switch over to uh, to another feature uh, that's coming out in 8.5? Actually, it was released in 8.4, but uh, but I think users, I think the viewers should wait for 8.5. Uh, to try these out, and that's with scaffolding. So let me go ahead and close out of that instance. Uh, let me go back to. Okay, here it is. Right. Okay, but so what I want to do, I want uh, I want everybody to know that uh, that we have a really kind of great doc mm -hmm. that's available on um, in our in our Microsoft Docs here, and there's a link to this at the end. Yeah, what's cool with this too, by the way, I think a lot of people don't know these are the straight up ASP.NET Core docs, and then if you scroll down, or mm -hmm. I guess go to another one of them in here, yep. we have these different tabs. So you'll mm -hmm. see there Visual Studio for Mac, and when you switch that, it switches it for all of them. Yeah, that's so right. So we, we work together on these over the over December, January time frame we updating did, yeah, these, right? Yeah, right, that's right. So it, but, it, but it is cool as these new features come out, we mm -hmm. were going through and updating for things like scaffolding support. Yeah, so. you know, it, it, is, uh, it is pretty cool, and uh, and the, the whole goal with these tabs is, you know, we should have the same exact content, whether mm -hmm. it's Visual Studio or Visual Studio for Mac, but the screenshots yeah. would be different, right? That's that's kind of the goal. We're yeah. we're not 100% there yet, 
but you know we're, we're making progress every day basically. As we were updating these too, we did mm -hmm. find some cases where it's like, wait a minute, this is slightly different. I have to drop to command line. And then we filed bugs and it was, I, I loved yeah, that right. working with you on this yeah, and right. watching it get updated yeah. and get, I think that's in 8.5. 8.5, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah, so for, for scaffolding, <clears throat> it was actually released in 8.4. For uh, Razor pages, but not for MVC. Yeah, that's right. right. And, and, you, and uh, to, to be honest with you, we did find some, some kind of issues with scaffolding in 8.4. Fortunately, 8.5, like you said, yeah, expected that's right. this week. That's so. right. And in 8.5, you're going to get a much kind of better scaffolding experience out of Visual Studio for Mac. So I think, you know, let's just wait another 24 hours, hopefully, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then take that one. Cool. Um, yeah, so this is actually the, the sample that I've got open is actually created from this doc here. Okay. Um, so, so if people want to follow along, mm -hmm. we'll have a link to this tutorial at the very end of the that's day. That's right. But it's, that's it's right. a Razor Pages movie. Yeah, that, that's exactly yeah. right. Razor Pages movie, and you know, it's from start to, to finish, basically. File new project to having a whole entire application running here. So yeah, I've already created uh, this model class, which I just kind of copy, uh, copy and pasted uh, mm -hmm. from from the from the dock itself. So now what we'll do is right click and say add a new scaffolding. <clears throat> For this one I'm going to pick uh, Razor Pages with Entity Framework CRUD. Mm -hmm. So that's the one that will create like several files for you. You know if you it'll the do views. create, read, update, yeah. uh, delete details uh, and then also a uh, an index file there as well. Great. All right, so for model class to use, I've got my movie model uh, and then here, you would just basically type in uh, whatever name for the database context that you want. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just Razor, Pages, Movie, Movie Context. Yep. And then uh, one thing that I forgot to point out was the area that you right click in the solution pad, you know, the folder that you right click there mm -hmm. is going to be where these files will be generated. Uh, right. So in this case, that was under Pages Movie that I right clicked Add yeah. New Scaffolding, right? Yep. Let's go ahead and click Finish here. Uh, this is this is also a pretty kind of similar experience to uh, Visual Studio. The the UI is a little bit different. They have like kind of a tree view there, and we have more of a list view. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, just like with .NET New, and this this also was something that I worked on in Visual Studio with scaffolding. Uh, yeah. uh, when we when we created scaffolding, we also kind of had that same mindset, saying you know first we're going to kind of surface it in Visual Studio. And, and we'll also surface it on the command line, and yeah. then we'll also be able to surface it wherever else that we yeah. need to. So, so need, this is need the to see place. that all come together. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. yeah, it is. And it's also kind of like uh, Groundhog Day, too. You know, it's like <laughs> doing the same thing over and over. Yeah, and over. Yeah. You know, it's like, hold on, <laughs> I've built this feature before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then this has created those views then under the, uh, or it's, cr it's, it's creating them now, creating yeah. Them so, now. so actually, there's a lot of stuff that goes on into this. You know, and I think this, Scaffolding really does kind of highlight the difference between editor and IDE, right? Yeah. So if you were to do this manually, you know, you'd have to edit, you'd have to modify your project file to add a bunch of NuGet packages, add a add the the tool to the project itself, mm -hmm. uh, and then you'd have to run, and then you know, just running the the ASP.NET code generator on the command line is like is like a huge call yeah. and you know that's very easy to kind of here it is right here actually yeah, you can see it's, it's calling it and it's obvious if you flip the different tabs in that tutorial mm -hmm. you'll see if you do the visual studio code approach yeah. it's like run this do this you make a typo mm -hmm. you're you you know in trouble I mean, yeah look at look at this uh, look at this command line here do yeah. you know what i mean it's like it's got to be more than like 100 characters here you know i mean there's no chance you can type that in without some sort of an error right right so so that i think it kind of highlights the difference so uh, so now it's basically just kind of completed, so or finishing uh, completing, and, and that's just the first time that it does this, right? After I've oh yeah, that's after right. I've got that set that's up, right. then I've that's got right. all the scaffolding that's right. support. That's right. Yeah. So the first time that you do scaffolding for a project, it will take a little bit more mm -hmm. time because they got to add the NuGet packages and the the tool. Yep. Uh, but after that, it's a lot faster. So let's go take a look at some of the content that was created here. So I've got my index page here, <coughs> and then we can see the the other ones that we kind of mentioned before. Uh, and before I showed you that we can start debugging this with the play sign, uh, we can also do start without debugging. Uh, and normally I do start without debugging, unless I'm really trying to debug something. A little bit it's, faster. It's a little right? bit faster. Uh, so yeah, it saves you a few seconds, but you know those, those seconds, they will uh, definitely add up over time, obviously. All right, so we've got our, we've got our app created here. Uh, I'm going to go to slash movies. And oh, 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 actually, you know what? My bad. There was a couple steps that I forgot to mention. So let me go back to uh, to the tutorial here. So 
basically what happened was we scaffolded out the content. Mm -hmm. And now what we need to do is to kind of uh, set up our database here. Right. Right. So that's where we'll go to, uh, to here. I'm going to copy a couple of commands here. Oh, actually, you know what? And as you're doing that, let me talk while yeah. you type. One cool feature that we've got planned for 8.6, which is in the May timeframe, is an integrated terminal. So right now, I mean, you can use any terminal you like, iTerm or whatever, um, but that's a cool feature coming out with 8.6 so that I can directly in, the, in Visual Studio for Mac itself, I can do that. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so what you're doing now is you're actually, the scaffolding created the migration, but we actually need to run the migration and create, create the tables and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, well, actually what happened was scaffolding, so we had a model, it created a database context, but the migrations were not created yet. So what we're doing right now is actually creating, uh, the, right. creating the initial migration, and the migrations will be stored in your project as well. And then the next command, Oh, okay. So yeah, if you ever get uh, if you ever get this error when you're doing scaffolding, yep, uh, that means that you're probably running your app. Oh, which I'm doing here. So, right. So the right. the DLLs are basically locked. Yeah. Uh, so I've run into that a bunch of times before. So so if you ever run into that, now I know. That's, that's a good thing to know. Yep. Um, so yeah. So now it's going to go through and uh, it's going to create the initial migration, and then build it and everything. Uh, now what we're going to do is go and actually update the database itself. In yep. this case, it will actually create the database. So the first was setting up the migrations, and this is actually running the running the migrations, which will create the database tables or create yeah, the database right, and the tables. Right. Right. The first step was you know creating the migration. Yeah. And that's like some .cs file. Yeah. And then this one is actually running the migration. Yep. So that's what we've done. Uh, if I go back to if I go back to my project here, I can see now I have a .db file. That's the SQL. SQLite file there. Yep. Let's do start without uh, debugging one more time, and then uh, and then hopefully we'll be able to go and create like one or two movies. Sounds good. And then go from there. Yeah, right. All right, there we go. So let's say create new, and I'll say I don't know what year. What well, I should have gotten more prepared and actually yeah. figured out all this information. You know what I mean? It's and it's pretty small. It's hard to see. Oh, so okay, got it. Let's zoom in a little bit. Ah, uh, yeah. All right, so let's create that. All right, so we've created one. Uh, you know, obviously we could create another one as well, uh, but that doesn't really matter. Let's go into edit here. So these are all pages mm -hmm. that were just created from that scaffolding step, right? You know, and working so, against the state of the yeah, live database. Exactly, working against that live database. So, so you can see here. You know, I've got. Uh, basically, I've got, I've, got, I've got a kind of good scaffolding for an app here. You know, mm -hmm. then I'm going to have to go through and kind of fill it in and kind of polish it and, and sure. make it to be my own. But you know, at the end of the day, I can create new movies. I can edit those movies. I can delete those movies. I can inspect the details of those movies. Yeah, a lot of really great functionality here, with you know, pretty much low effort here as well. You know, that that's the idea of an IDE is to help you be more kind of productive. Yeah, and you like know? you pointed out, those files afterwards are yours to edit. Like those views, I can go in and <coughs> change them however I want to, but I don't have to name a title of the movie, date, right. the time, map yeah. everything back and forth. Yep. It's a grunt work to do that. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yep. That's cool. Right. All right, so that's what we've got uh, scaffolding-wise. Let's go to the to the next slide here and uh, see what we're going to do now. So, so now we're gonna we're gonna take a kind of a closer look at uh, building and running uh, the applications, right? So, so one kind of big thing there is launch settings.json support, mm -hmm. and I actually created launch settings.json support. So that that actually first showed up as a Visual Studio uh, uh, feature, and like then it's Groundhog Day. And then yeah, and then <laughs> and then uh, and then user said, hey, I I need launch settings.json support at the command line, and then we so added what's it the at point the of launch line. settings.json? Yeah, so launch settings.json is really a it's a developer file. So let's go and uh, let me open up this other project that I have here. So launch settings.json is a JSON file that declares how your application should start. Okay. Yeah. So we can have things in there like you know the uh, the URL to the file. Uh, oh, we got too many files open here. I think. <laughs> Just one second. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so so we can see with launch settings.json you can have like multiple kind of profiles is what what they're called, but uh, it basically will declare how your application will start for development. Okay. Launch settings.json is only used in developer scenarios. It's not used in any any production scenario, and it's not even published a file. Got it. So some things that we can see here are the 
the environment variables, including ASP.NET Core environment. So, you know, this is the one uh, where right. when you're doing development, you want that environment variable to be set to development, but mm -hmm. when you're in production, you want it to be to production or something besides development. That's a really important feature of ASP.NET Core. A lot of developers I talk to don't really understand that enough, how, how important environment variables are. Because mm -hmm. you can set them, like you're saying here in launch settings, and then when I deploy it, like say to, you know, a web server, uh, Nginx, or, you know, maybe uh, to Azure, I can go into Azure and set those app settings there. You know what I mean? And override yeah, that's right. those. That's so, right. That's cool. right. Yep. So, yeah. And then, uh, and then also the, the application URL. So, now let me show you how we would, uh, how we could uh, modify this one, right? So, on the web app here, I will choose uh, options. Oh, obviously, you could edit that file directly if you wanted to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, that, that's, that's kind of one choice. Uh, if I were to go in here, uh, and then let's say let's say I'm going to add a new kind of environment variable here. So I'll say demo demo value. Oh, uh, I escaped it. And then let's uh, let's click OK on that one. Did it? Did I? Oh, you know I think I got the wrong. Uh, oh, long, wrong one. Wrong one open here. Yeah, I, th I think I had the wrong one open here. But uh, but in, anyways. Uh, so as opposed to like. Messing with JSON schema, I can go in and edit mm -hmm. it in there, and it'll it'll update yeah. it for me. Yeah, and then the the kind of the great thing is, you know, the your Visual Studio counterpart or your Visual Studio Code counterpart would get those kind of same uh, settings and and run behavior as well. Right, yeah, right. That's okay. right. Yep. Cool. So that's the that's the launch settings that JSON support, and uh, and so now here I've opened up a a different uh, solution that I've been. That I've been developing for a while here. It's a it's an app that shows templates that are available for .NET New. Oh, nice! So there's a couple things I want to show you here that we've recently added here. So one is the the browser selector. Let me zoom in on this a little bit. So browser selector. So here it will show you whatever browsers you have installed and and that's picked up from Mac OS, like it yeah, looks at right. your registered yeah. browsers. Yeah. Cool. So in Mac OS in the settings, you know there there's a place where you can choose the default browser. And the, the items that show up in this list are the same exact items that show up in that list. Even cool. even some things that are unexpected here, but yeah. but th that is how they're registering themselves as browsers, and 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 they actually do work somewhat as browsers as well. <laughs> uh, so here we can see I can choose my different browser, and this uh, the the behavior in Visual Studio for Mac is slightly different from Visual Studio. So with Visual Studio for Mac, the setting is kind of stored with the project itself, uh, and it kind of travels with the project. I actually kind of like that. <laughs> in, in Visual Studio, it's, it's more of a global kind of setting for mm -hmm. all your projects and solutions. Uh, so there is that difference there. Uh, another thing I wanted to show you here, you know, as we take a look here, this .NET new web app, the, the kind of architecture is, you know, there's a, there's a Razor Pages front end, mm -hmm. uh, but the back end is an ASP.NET Core Web API project, right? I think I know where you're going with this. It's always a pain where I'll start up my web project, and then I'll think, oh, no, I forgot to start up my API, and my web app depends on the API, and it's not working. And right. larger projects may have four or five projects. Oh, uh, yeah, to easy. That's up. right. Yeah. Yep. So right. now, so what I want to do is I want to launch my API project and my web project at the same time, whenever I start with mm -hmm. or without debugging. So I'm going to right-click on the solution and say Set Startup Projects. Uh, and th this is also an area that, you know, uh, has a l there's a little bit difference in how it's actually been implemented, but we try to offer the same kind of uh, feeling for it, yeah. right? So in Visual Studio for Mac, we have this thing called run configurations, mm -hmm. and Visual Studio doesn't have that. So in Visual Studio for Mac, you can create several different run configurations. So let's say let's say if you had a huge solution with 20 projects, and mm -hmm. if you're testing one microservice. You want to start up these three projects, and if you're testing a different microservice, uh, you want to start up these right. other four projects. Right. You could achieve that with run configurations, and then you can easily switch back. Toggle and forth. between those different That's run right. configurations. Yep. Nice. But but for the basic case, you're going to use it just like you do in Visual Studio. Yep. Uh, there's just this additional click to create the run configuration. Um, so here I, I can select the the different types of uh, the different projects that I want to start. So I'll pick the API and the web project, and then we'll uh, click OK for that. And we can see this value has just changed, right? Before, I think it was set to templates API, right? Yeah. That, that's the one that, this is the selector where you pick what you want to run, right? So if you wanted to change back to just the API mm -hmm. or something, you could do that. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yep, yeah. yep, yep, yep. So we'll, we'll keep it on uh, multi -proje multiple projects here. And then uh, we'll do start without debugging. The keyboard shortcut is uh, option, command, return. And uh, so yeah, we'll see. This is going to go ahead and fire up uh, the... 
so we can see here it yeah. kind of fired up our API project here as well as our uh, as well as our web application here. But let me go back and uh, what I want to do is actually uh, start with debugging here. So let me do a command return on that one. While you're doing that, I just want to point out those keyboard shortcuts are really cool and you've been working to get together some of the top keyboard shortcuts. And yes. one of the giveaways we have during the code party at the end of the day is we actually have coffee mugs with some of the top keyboard shortcuts. Right, right, so. right. And we have the so we've created, you know, PDF files. That's right. Yeah, so yeah. We yeah. have two different versions. We got the Visual Studio for Mac shortcuts by themselves. And then we also have a uh, we have another PDF that compares Visual Studio and Visual Studio so for Mac. So if you're Mac used shortcuts. to Visual Studio for mm -hmm. Windows, then you can go over to Visual Studio for Mac and line up which the shortcuts are. Yeah, that's right. And we'll be that's sharing right. those out during I think Michaela and Kendra's session on productivity at the end of the day, they're gonna be sharing that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, cool. that's right. Yeah, so they're gonna have they're gonna have a link to it, and uh, if I recall correctly, the link is aka.ms/vsm-keyboard-shortcuts. But but they'll have right. the links there. Uh, th they'll definitely have the links there, and uh, I'm working on updating the the doc as well to have those links. Cool. So what I've done is uh, so here I've I've uh, I've started debugging here, mm -hmm. and uh, and I hit a breakpoint. So I wanted to show you know kind of a couple debugging uh, features that we have here. So obviously breakpoints is is one of them. And we can see now we're, we've stopped on a breakpoint. Yep. Now I can go into uh, inspecting uh, the variables. Uh, we can also do things like step over. So let me go ahead and step over here. Uh -huh. now, did you do run without debugging? No, I did. Oh, okay. I did. Uh, I did start run with debugging. With okay. debugging. Yeah, okay, that's right. Cool. Yep. Very cool. Let me do. Uh, let's turn this breakpoint off. Let me show show a new feature that we have. Uh, it would be uh, run to cursor. Nice. So let's go ahead and do that. So run to cursor. Basically, what that does is w wherever your wherever the debugger is paused at, mm -hmm. and then you do run to cursor. It will continue execution until it gets to that particular location. Great. Okay. But uh, I'll contrast that with a different feature that I'll show you next. So here we can see that you know you can inspect your variables here, um, whether they be lists or whatnot, and you could also uh, you can also edit these values here. So let's say you know, I want to say, hey, John G uh, mm -hmm. is the author of this one instead yep. of Microsoft, right? So I can I can do things like that as well. Uh, so yeah, similar similar kind of uh, features as to what what's available in Windows. So you can e you can edit variables in two places, then one is during those in those inspectors, and then there's also mm -hmm. the whole uh, the quick watch or the locals. watch windows. Yeah. yeah. So so I have them down here, but let me show you in case uh, in case in case those pads are not available here. The way that you would get into it is view debug pads, and let's say if I go into watch here. And I if you're new same. to Visual Studio for Mac, that's a, new, a concept that I had to pick up was pads. Um, pads, pa yeah, right. pads is a yep. term, is that's what you're looking for. That's right, that's right. Yeah, so pads are, you know, kind of in, in Visual Studio, we would probably call them tool panes or, uh, or panes, yeah. right? So yeah. those are what, what pads are, right? Like we got the solution pad or the output pad right. or the watch pad or the locals pad. So yeah, that's right. So yeah, we, we've got the, the watch pad, the locals pad, uh, the uh, the immediate pad is over here too somewhere. Uh, I think maybe I don't have it open, but uh, it's it's available in that uh, in that location that I just showed. Cool. Um, so I just showed how we can kind of inspect and edit variables. Uh, one of the so let's say let's say in this case, you know, I got this call to template packs and it's calling this uh, this method here. And let's say the let's say the value was something that I wasn't expecting, and I wanted to kind of redo that step. Mm -hmm. Right. What I would do is. Uh, I could right click and say set next statement. So earlier we talked about run to cursor, right? So I said right. with run to cursor, wherever wherever the debugger is paused, you put your cursor on a different location, you say run to cursor, it will just continue the execution of your application. Whenever it gets to that line, then the debugger pauses again. So it's kind of like setting a breakpoint and saying run, kind of. It's saying go yeah, ahead and run right. and, and like right. run until that, I get That's it. exactly what run to cursor is. Yeah, okay. it's like almost a temporary breakpoint. So this is different here. Mm -hmm. Set next statement, you're actually saying, I don't care where you're at in the program, go here. Exactly, that's right. Okay. That's right, yeah. So set next statement is, you know, kind of, it's is very kind of invasive, I guess, kind of, right? Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't matter what you where you were at before, it literally changes the next line of code mm -hmm. to that to that point. So, you know, if you set your next statement to like weird places, yeah, you, know, you, you may get you might have no problems, or whatever. You know, yeah. like you know, like let's say if you go outside of your method into a different method, you know, you mm -hmm. might have some exceptions there, obviously, but you'll have the same experience in Windows. Yeah. Uh, but normally, this is used for you know, you make a call to some sort of a method, 
it comes back with some weird result and you just want to do it again and maybe yeah. step into that method this time, right? Got it. So that's what I did. So I just did set next statement uh, and then we can see now the debugger is here basically ready uh, to kind of party on with it. <laughs> Let's go ahead and stop that one. Um, so another, another feature that we've added recently is the ability to kind of manage NuGet packages at the solution level. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this was either 8.3 or 8.4. Uh, so I just right clicked the solution and said manage NuGet packages. If I go to the update tab here, we can see that uh, there's a few uh, packages here that, uh, that I could update. Yep. Right? So let's, let's say, for example, if I wanted to update my newtonsoft.json, I could select that package and then, and then pick update packages. Uh -huh. And then I'll be prompted, you know, for what projects do you want to update these packages for? S so and since it's, it's a solution level, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll look across all of those projects. Yeah, that nice. are using that particular package, right? Got it. That's right. Um, I'm not going to do that here, uh, but we definitely could do that. All right. OK, so let me go into, uh, let's take a look at uh, some, of the, some of the kind of editor features that we have, right? And, yeah. and we've recently ported over the same exact editors from Visual Studio into Visual Studio for Mac. So the editing experience should be pretty familiar. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to kind of highlight here is the multi-caret editing. So here I've got, uh, I've got a list here. And let's say I want to add one class to each list item here. So yeah. I've put my cursor where I want the first one. So what I'll do is uh, Control, Option, Click to create another car uh, caret and another one. And let's say I just want to add a new class uh, for highlight. So Fancy. that's kind of multi-caret uh, multi editing. And yeah. that works in a variety of different files in Visual Studio for Mac as well. Nice. We're kind of near the okay. end here, so we should <laughs> let's um, we should switch over to I guess the slides where we can oh. show people where to find out more stuff. Oh yeah, great idea. Yeah, yeah right. I'm not uh, I'm not very good with slides, you know. <laughs> so, so I force. He's like, I just got all demos. I'm like, let me throw some slides at you. <laughs> throw you off. Yeah. So so yeah, right. obviously, like basically every. Um, Every side deck we're ending up with, like download the newest Visual Studio for Mac, and like you said, right. 8.5 expected right. out this week has some cool, yep. cool yeah, updates. Yeah, definitely, definitely a lot of cool updates for sure. Yep. Yeah, right. And then yeah. that that Razor Pages tutorial, the Razor Pages movie, that was one that we both updated. You did all the work. I did a few things, and that that was mm -hmm. uh, that one also. We've got linked here, and that's the one that showed yep. scaffolding. That's right. Everything. That's right. That's a really cool tutorial, and there's also kind of an MVC counterpart uh, for that as well. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. So I think now we're ready to take some questions. Oh, okay, great. Awesome. Great stuff. Uh, so much goodness for ASP.NET uh, Core developers on VS for Mac. All the additions that we've added through the last few months make the, the productivity so much uh, better. So we have a couple of questions, but uh, first I wanted to uh, give a shout out to Anze here because as we were um, having the previous session, Anze is part of the product team, but what's exciting is that he was actually watching the show. He's like, I feel so inspired now. I need to go <laughs> back and use the product more. So he's a Visual Studio for Mac uh, PM and he loves the product so much. He felt inspired from our <laughs> session. So it's great. <laughs> Inspiring our own people. Um, we have a question for you, uh, um, um, Said and uh, John. Uh, when should I use gRPC over traditional APIs? Like people want to know about which one is better now. Yeah, right. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so I think that would have been a really great question for our previous presenter, Brady Gaster. I, th I think he could have given a better answer to that. But, uh, but let me let me let me try and answer it. Um, so I think I think uh, gRPC services are more preferred when you're communicating within your own applications, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say if you you have an application that consists of several microservices and you want a high performance experience, you know, of the communicating between these these different. Uh, these different applications. That's one area that you would use gRPC. Right. Uh, but you know, I think if you were to contrast it, like let's say if you want to just create like a, an API that anybody could access, right? I, I don't think gRPC is the is the right approach for that. But I'm, I'm yeah, totally sure. gRPC is a binary format, very high performance. But like you said, it's a little harder to share, and you were right. requiring also support. Not every browser supports gRPC. Not every yeah. client can support that. It requires HTTP2 oh, and yeah, all that's that. Right, that's right. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think for internal services, you want that really high performance, and you have control over client and the service. Yeah, gRPC. But for something you're sharing, I agree right. with you. The that's right. H that's REST right. APIs. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Yep. Great stuff. 
Um, so gRPC, it's fairly new as well, and um, we saw before that it's very well supported inside uh, VS for Mac, and there'll be more uh, support coming soon. Um, now, the next one is going to be about uh, deploying ASP.NET Core to Docker, and um, I think the question here is how well is Docker supported with uh, Visual Studio for Mac? Oh, sure, right, yeah, yeah, right, okay, great. So yeah, um, so if I, if, I have a, um, if I have an application here, uh, what I can do is I can right click on my project and say add uh, Docker support here. Uh, and this will, this will then uh, create a new project called you know, Docker Compose and that will be set to the, to the startup project. And uh, it, it's kind of similar to, to the features in, uh, in Visual Studio. Uh, they uh, they, they do, do have some additional features on the, uh, on the Windows side, but uh, that, that's an area that we're looking for kind of feedback and mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to figure out you know, what missing features should we kind of implement first. But like the main things you were saying that it does for you is set up the Docker file and yeah. set up the project support for it. Yeah, that's right. And it, and it does it in a way that would work with Visual Studio users as well. Ah, cool. Yeah, that's right. Yep. All right. Yep. Great question, yeah. So there you have it. We have ASP.NET Core, high-performance gRPC, REST APIs, Docker support, microservices, all supported on inside uh, Visual Studio for Mac. Now, before we uh, jump into our next uh, session with uh, Jeff to talk about serverless awesomeness on, on a Mac with .NET Core, we're going to take a quick break. So stay tuned, and we'll see you in a bit.